How are you guys doing? Good. Some of you. Some of you guys are like, uh, it's morning. I get it. It's been a while since we've been back, right, since I've been here. Since Maggie's been here, right? No, you were here last week. You were just hiding in the back with the kiddos. Yeah. It's good. It's good to be back. There's this little trick uh, that church consultants do. Actually, first of all, let's talk about what a church consultant is. A church consultant is an expert in the field of church growth that comes in and helps a church that is struggling for whatever reason, whether it's a recent crisis or continuous slow decline. We have a church consultant. His name is Gary. Many of you guys have met him. He's a really cool guy. Lots of ministry experience. Um, The term expert, in his case, really applies in some church consultants. It's a different definition of expert. An expert is anyone that lives more than 100 miles away. Um, (laughs) It's amazing. It's amazing what distance can do. Church consultants have this little trick. Almost everyone I know that has worked in that field, almost every book on church consulting ever written, has this little trick in it that is equal parts amusing and really, really sad. It goes something like this. Church consultants coming in for their first visit with a church and they get there a little bit early, get in town a little bit early, and they drive around a little, and they go to local businesses, places where people congregate, and they ask the same question. Hey, I'm trying to get to, insert church name, where is it? Can you help me get there? And normally the response you'll get from a church that has suffered an extended decline is, I've never heard of that place. So if Gary, I don't know if Gary did this trick or not, because Gary was brought on before, I got here. Uh, But if Gary did this trick, it would be something like this. He might go to the Circle K up the road, right? Literally, you can walk into our parking lot and see it. (laughs) And go, hey, uh, have you guys heard of Berean Christian Church? Do you know where that is? And maybe they'd be like, yeah, it's that church on the corner. And if they said that, they'd say, oh, yeah, can you tell me anything about them? Kind of, you know, I'm looking around. I kind of want to know something about them. And the response might be something like, they're on the corner? (laughs) I don't know. He might go to the coffee shop downtown. Hey, have you guys heard of Brian Christian Church? Can you help me find it? Might go to the movie theater, go to the the DQ. Just ask around. Hey, have you guys heard of this church? Can you help me find it? And often the response is no. The reason why church consultants will do this sort of thing is so they can then come to the meeting and they'll kind of take notes, you know, on the responses that they got, and they can come to their meeting with the elders of the board, and they say, this is what your community thinks of you. And frequently, what your community thinks of you is, who are they? The point they're trying to make is that your church has failed to matter in the community. And if your church has failed to matter in the community, well, there's something that consultant needs to do, right? There's something that church needs to do. There's something that needs to change. Over the last two weeks, while I have not been here, you've gotten to listen to two men of the Ward household. So first of all, good job. That was great. They were great messages. Mitch talked about our generation, because we are right about the same age. I think there's a couple months between us, but we're about the same age. And he talked about our generation, the way that it views church, and specifically how many people in our generation view church as not only unnecessary, but as narrow, as old-fashioned or outdated. They view church people as judgmental, and unfortunately we've given people a lot of reason to think that. Russ talks about his generation and how church attendance was a big deal, but not much more than attendance. It was fire insurance. You get your butt in the seat, and then you get your one-way ticket to heaven, You don't have to worry much outside of that. I think the way that he put it was, the faith of his generation tended to be a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, on the surface, those two ideas seem pretty dissimilar, two very different views of churches. One views church as judgmental and unnecessary and outdated, while the other one views it as a sort of spiritual fire insurance. These seem very different on the surface, but they're not. They both reflect the exact same attitude, as a church consultant would use that little illustration to show. A community outside the walls of the church that looks at the church building and says, that's fine for them. But outside of those four walls, that church doesn't matter. 
church is fine for spiritual fire insurance, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't matter outside those four walls, anyone who is not in the pews or in the cushy little green seats isn't much going to care that it exists. When that church consultant shows up at the Circle K and says, hey, can you help me find Berean Christian Church? The answer they'll get is, who? People can view church as judgmental and narrow, but they'll still often, as Mitch pointed out, view it as, well, it's fine for them. You live your life how you want to live it, just don't tell me how to live mine. And that's fine, as long as the church doesn't matter outside of their four walls. This attitude is something that's a little bit disturbing to me, frankly. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Church mattering, and not why we gather together. We had that sermon right a few times. Why do we gather together for our own spiritual benefit? Why would we gather together in communities like this? This one's going to be a little bit different. We're asking the question, does church matter? More specifically, does church matter outside of our building? Because in here, yeah, we get good teaching, and we have friends, and there's like people that watch our kids for a while so we don't have to deal with them, right? <laughs> it's great. But does church matter outside of these four walls? Because if it doesn't, then my generation, Mitch's generation, Russ's generation, they're all right. That's fine for some people. It's not necessary. It's not needed. In fact, it may not even be beneficial. Does church matter outside of the church building? Let's start in Romans 12. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Paul, writing this letter to the church in Rome, says this. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, then serve well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership responsibility, then lead well. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do so gladly. This text came up actually not very long ago in another sermon, so we won't belabor it too much. The key point of this text, pretty simple, is you have a talent, use it, right? If your gift is serving others, serve. If you're a teacher, then teach. If you are giving, then give. And many of us have more than one gift or gifts that are not on this list. If you have any sort of ability or talent, and trust me, you do, use it. The context of this verse is especially interesting to me because the beginning of Romans chapter 12 is a couple of verses that we really like to like put on signs like hang in our kitchens and stuff and it's like this really pretty flowery verse but it's a very very important one for understanding what Paul is saying here. A rough paraphrase of it is something like this. Your life should be a living sacrifice. Does that sound familiar? Your life should be a living sacrifice pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by a renewing of your mind. This is your spiritual act of worship. Paul kicks off the chapter with those words because he's cluing us in. How many of you have ever written an essay before? Ever, in any context, right? Yeah? Okay, so most of us have written an essay. And the way you're generally taught is you have your little intro paragraph where you're trying to grab someone's attention, and then you have a thesis statement. The Bible is literature. It's a lot of different types of literature, but when you have something like the letters that Paul writes, they're very much essays. And within it, he has various thesis statements, which he then goes on to prove, right? Your thesis statement is saying, this essay is about, and then you give the topic, and then the rest of your essay is trying to prove your point. Paul's thesis statement is there's a certain type of way you should live, which he describes as being a living sacrifice. And this way of living is pleasing to the Lord. It is the way you are designed to operate within the world. And then he goes on to describe it, to give details, to show support. And part of his argument is Romans 12, 6 through 8, that you have a talent, you have a gift, you have an ability, and you should use it, not for yourself. Not to grandstand or build your platform, but to serve and benefit others. In fact, he summarizes it pretty well in verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. There's this phrase that I cringe every time I hear. 
because it sounds like it belongs in like a Hallmark card, but it's valid. Love is a verb. Now, when we say it, then we say it because it sounds nice, but biblically speaking, love is a verb. It is a thing that you do. There are four words in Greek for love. Three of them are used in the New Testament. The one used most often I've introduced you to before, it is agapao. Can you say that? Agapao. Agapao is not an emotion. In fact, you can very much dislike someone and still agapao love them. It is an intellectual decision to behave in the best interest of another person. It is, in fact, synonymous, the way the biblical authors use it, with another word that I did an entire series on, hypotasso. Can you say that word, hypotasso? Which means submission. Submission and love are synonymous in the New Testament. Right? We did that sermon before, so I'll leave that one there. Love is a verb. It's a thing that you do. You decide to act in someone's best, best interest, even if you don't particularly like them as a person. So when Paul says, don't pretend to love others, really love them, he's not saying, don't pretend to have flowery feelings for someone, actually force yourself to feel a certain way. But no, he doesn't care how you feel about them. Let me repeat that because some of you need to hear it. He doesn't care if you dislike them. He's saying, get over it, put on your big boy pants, and act in their best interest anyways. The verse is right before this. You have talents, so use them. Let's follow that that train of thought. You have talents, so use them. Act in the best interest of others, and then hate what is wrong. What's the implication there? It is right for you to use your abilities, your gifts, your talents, your time, your effort, your resources to benefit those around you. If that's what is right, then by implication, what's wrong? Not doing that. that. In other words, it's sinful to fail to serve those around you. If I walked in here cold and we had none of this context and I said, hey, uh, name some sins for me, then you would be like, oh, lying, cheating, stealing. What other ones might we come up with? Gossip. Gossip. That's a good one. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Yeah. Anger. Or at least certain forms of it, right? The kind that makes you like insult someone or like road rage at someone, right? We can name a few other ones, but they're like not polite, so we probably won't say them in public. But we can think, we're thinking of some other ones, we're just like, I'm not going to say that with a preacher in the room. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. But we can name some sins. The thing is, most of those things are things that we do. Unforgiveness is in a different category. It's something that we fail to do. And that's exactly what Paul's saying here. There's a whole classification of sins that we never think about because they aren't things that you do, they're things you fail to do. They are sins of omission. When God says, do this, and you go, meh, And we do that a lot more than the other kind, right? Because you can catch yourself gossiping and be like, man, I shouldn't do this. It's hard, but you can do it. What's much harder to detect is when the Lord says, you have a gift, use it, and you go, but Sunday's football day, right? There are sins of omission. What's wrong in this context? Failing to serve others. The early church understood this, that we have a commandment to serve those around us, to use our gifts and our talents and our abilities to serve, and that failing to do so is a sin. And we see that in passages like 1 Timothy 5, which is awesome if you're a nerd. I love this chapter. Here's just a little chunk of it. Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy, who's serving as essentially the lead pastor in the church in the city of Ephesus. He says this, a widow who is at least, or who is to be put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old and was faithful to her husband, and she must be well respected by everyone because of the good that she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers and served others humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? This is just a smaller chunk of a very extended section where Paul is laying out instructions for Timothy to decide who's going to go on the church's widow list. Now, we don't have a widow list because it's not as much of a need in a modern society. 
But let's explore kind of what it was. In fact, this dates back to Acts 6, which would have been several decades before this letter was written. The church at that point, only in the city of Jerusalem, realized there are these people in our communities that are in great need, this demographic that is not being served well. No one else seems to care about them, so we're going to. And so they compiled a list of female widows, especially older ones. Why? That's part of it. Part of it is that they're past childbearing age. Let's explore that a little bit. In an ancient society, they lived somewhat differently than us, yes? One of the core social differences is that in most contexts, it was not acceptable for a woman to have a job. In most contexts, it wasn't normal, although there may be exceptions, for women to own property. The ways that you make money back then, as with today, is by owning something of value or doing something of value. You have a job or you own a resource of some variety. Today, it could be property or stocks or whatever, or a factory. But you have a resource or you have a job. That's how you make money. That's how you provide for yourself and your families. If you're a female and you're not allowed to have a job and you're not allowed to own anything, how are you supposed to make money? You don't. You can beg or you can be a prostitute or you can have someone else provide for you. And that last option was the normal one. So at a fairly young age, you would be married off to someone, you would leave your father's house, and then your husband would provide for you. So what happens if, say, you know, you live with your husband for a very long time, he's a little bit older than you, that was fairly standard, and so he's 70, you're 60, your husband dies, and your kids won't help. See, normally your retirement plan was not like the index fund that you invested in for years because that did not exist. Rather, your retirement plan was your children. If your husband died and you did not have anything left to take care of yourself with, which was fairly standard, your children were expected to take you in to provide you with clothing and food and shelter until you also kicked the bucket and then they would bury you and they would move on with their lives. That was your retirement plan. But what happens if you don't have any kids or if your kids don't like you and they abandoned you or if you had kids but they all died before your husband did and now you are alone? What options do you have? You can beg. And because of your age, you probably don't even have the option of being a prostitute. That's, yeah, you're giggling, but this is a reality. Try to put yourself in that person's shoes. You can beg, and that's pretty much it. And what if people aren't very generous to you? You're going to starve. That's it. And the church saw this need and said, this is not acceptable. We don't want people begging. We don't want people turning to prostitution. We don't want people starving to death. So what are we going to do? We're going to compile a list of a bunch of widows who need our help, and we're going to help them. Wow. Revolutionary. (laughs) Back in Acts 6, they did it. In 1 Timothy 5, they still are, decades later. And Paul is simply giving instructions. He's dealing with the reality that the church has limited resources. So he's trying to say, Timothy, this is how you put yourself in position to figure out who has the most need. One of the qualifications why he says at least 60 years old, she's past childbearing age and they're too old to remarry in that culture. It's just not going to happen. So if you're younger than that, you have a chance of remarrying and then you can remarry and your husband can provide for you and all that junk. So he's dealing with social realities. He's saying, who are the most vulnerable people? Older female widows. We're going to take care of them. Amazing. They're simply applying the same lessons that Paul's talking about in Romans 12. You have gifts, you have abilities, you have resources. Use them to benefit those around you. Does the church in 1 Timothy 5 matter outside the walls of the buildings they meet in? Yes, they do. There's a verse from Jeremiah 29 that really sticks out to me when we're talking about subjects like this. Jeremiah 29, 7 says, work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you, or where I sent you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he never said anything happy. (laughs) Like ever. Like, can you imagine having a nickname like that? Like, yeah, that's weeping Laura. Never says anything happy to anyone. Like, that'd be horrible, wouldn't it? I would hate having that reputation. Jeremiah 
is known as the weeping prophet because the vast majority of his ministry was spent in the kingdom of Judah. There's the kingdom of Israel, and then there was a civil war, and the southern part broke apart from the northern part. So the northern part was called Israel, the southern part was called Judah. And he spent most of his career in Judah telling them that they were sinning and that God was going to judge them, which will earn you a reputation rather quickly, yeah? Eventually, Jeremiah was proven right. After years and years of sermons and very strange prophetic illustrations, eventually his predictions that God is going to judge you and send you into exile was proven correct because, well, Jeremiah was receiving a message from the Lord and kind of had some insights that most of us don't get. After the people were carried away, most of the people were carried away into exile in the city of Babylon, which is the, uh, the seat of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Jeremiah, who is still living in Jerusalem along with a few of the people that are allowed to remain, sends a letter to these exiles giving them instructions. And he opens the letter saying, these are the words of the Lord. In other words, I'm just writing these down. This message is from Yahweh. If you don't like it, take it up with him. <laughs> Which is like my favorite line ever, right? Whenever I say something controversial, I'm like, if that was Paul, not me. Go yell, at him. get your Ouija board out and yell at him because it's not... Jeremiah says, this is Yahweh's message, not my own. And part of the message directly from the mouth of the Lord is work for the peace and the prosperity of the city that just killed your fathers, your brothers, and your husbands and forced you into house arrest in a city that you've never been to before. It's uncomfy, isn't it? These are people they have every reason to hate. And God says, work for their benefit. Work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. There's a little bit of a selfish motivation here at the end, right? If the city does well, so will you. But God could bless the people in exile without blessing the city. If he's the God of the universe, he's probably capable of that, right? He could have made his people prosper and told the Babylonians, like, no, you were mean to my kids. I'm not helping you. But he didn't. He said, do everything you can to benefit the city that you are in. Even though they do not follow the same God as you, even though they do not behave as you behave, even though they treat you dreadfully, just absolutely treat you dreadfully. If you don't believe me that they treated them dreadfully, go read the book of Esther, because it's all about how a group within Babylon tried to wipe out the Jewish people. I mean, actual genocide. And God still says, work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. No matter how, what they do, no matter how they behave. That is a message to the people of God in the Old Testament and in the New. There's a city that you've been placed in, and some of these cities, they will treat you well, and they will love you, and they will see you as a part of the community, and some, they will make you outcasts. And it doesn't matter how they behave. It doesn't matter whether they embrace you or not. Work for the benefit of the city that you are in. Does church matter? More specifically, does church matter outside the walls of the building that we meet in? The answer is sometimes. It depends on the church. But it should. Church matters when it matters to the community. God has placed us here for a reason. And there are plenty of things that happen inside the walls amongst our community that concerns only the believers that are beautiful, wonderful things. But if we're only doing that part, we're kind of ignoring the entire Great Commission, the go and teach them what I've taught you and baptize them, that thing. Kind of a command directly from the mouth of the Lord. And we can't just ignore that part of our mission. We can't. It's a sin of omission. It's wrong. The church matters when it matters to the community. So what has Berean done? Because I am about putting our money where our mouth is. I'm not going to go up here and teach about something that we aren't willing to do. So what have we done to benefit the community that we are in? Megan, Jared, are we doing anything to benefit the community around us? You guys been using any hours and hours to plan community events and outreaches and Yes, I'm being facetious, yes. Let's talk about some of the things that we've done. That community movie night, is that a small thing? Well, maybe it seems like it, but there's a lot of effort and money and time that goes into it. Why? Because we wanted to provide a safe and fun environment for families to come together and be families. 
We've done food drives for the food pantry that Megan works at, and we will continue to do things like that in the future. Mother's Day. We went out, uh, what, the Sunday before Mother's Day, right? We just handed out flowers and told every woman we could possibly find, we appreciate you. Whether you are a mother, there's a mother in your life. We appreciate you and all that you've done. You too often go unnoticed. Is it a small thing? Yes, it is a small thing, but it's something to benefit those around us, something to benefit our community. In fact, these things started adding up the movie nights and the free flowers and the whatever giveaways we do and the town cleanups that we're a part of because when Apple Festival was rolling around, someone that was not even in our congregation realized, oh, we're running low on volunteers. What should we do? I know Berean will help because they're always there for their community. They've been so active recently. We should ask Berean. And then Allison came back to us and was like, I wasn't the one who brought it up. But they want us to volunteer. They just brought, like, I didn't even, I didn't volunteer us. And they just said it. They just said we can trust Berean. So we're even building a reputation in our community. We're getting an opportunity as a church to serve the churches around us as well. Because in November, Gary, that wonderful minister that is mentor to me and a contributor to our church, a guide for our church, he's going to come in town. He's going to do a little half-day seminar for some of the churches in the area about how to organize and train your volunteers, which is something that a lot of churches just don't know how to do. And we get to help him with that. We get to be a catalyst for that. This upcoming spring, there'll be an ecumenical outreach. That means when a bunch of churches get together and like do a thing for the community, which means it's going to be more than just our volunteers, more than just our resources. We'll be able to do something a lot bigger because there'll be more of us. And Brian is one of the lead churches in that. Because of your effort and your gifts and your willingness to contribute. And we are a tiny church and we're already having an outsized impact because we've discovered this truth a long time ago, and this sermon is just so you don't forget. The church matters when it matters to the community. If you've been volunteering, thank you so, so, so much because these things would not be possible without you. And if up to this point, for whatever reason, you've been sitting on the sideline, that's okay, we still love you, we still want you here, but this is a call to join us, to find somewhere where your gifts fit, some way that you can contribute to the community around us. And I'm not sure exactly where each one of you fit. We can have individual conversations if you just don't know what you're supposed to do, whether it's working with the kids here that come to us, or whether it's something you can do with our teaching and preaching that you can help with, or whether it's becoming a deacon or even working towards becoming an elder, whether it's something with tech because our online presence is so important, or whether it's going out in the outreaches with Megan and Jared and all of our wonderful volunteers there and doing something directly with your hands and feet for the community. I don't know where each of you fit, but each of you fit somewhere. And the mission of the church is too important for any of us to be sitting on the sideline. The church matters when it matters to the community outside of our walls. And each and every one of us is supposed to be a part of that mission. And I hope that each and every one of us will be. Let's pray. We love you. And we always want to open our prayers with that because we do love you. And if we didn't, there's really not any reason for us to be interacting with you, I don't suppose. But we love you and we want to be like you. We want to imitate your actions, your graciousness. We want to stand on truth like you do. But Lord, we also want to get down on our hands and knees and wash someone's feet. Hopefully, metaphorically. We adore you and we want to serve your people, those that are not in these walls. Those that are not a part of a congregation all, or even those who deny your existence or acknowledge you, but they simply decide not to partake in your communities. We know that you still love them, so we still love them. We want to be an important part of their lives and contribute to their thriving. We want to show them what Jesus is like, what you're like. So God, we ask for more and more opportunities to do so. We ask for more bravery to step out, to do important things, to do things for the community that we thought were too big to do before, that we think we're too small, we don't have enough money or enough numbers. We want the bravery to be able to serve in amazing ways. Lord, we ask these things, not that we would grow our own platform, but so that we would grow yours. If any of us, myself included, would become prideful in this, I ask that you would humble us, preferably gently, But if that doesn't work, then do what's necessary, Lord. Again, 
We love you and want to be like you. In Jesus' name, for the sake of this congregation and for this community, we pray. Amen. Guys, before we continue.